everybody. Welcome. I know what you're thinking. The food is excellent. Yes. But we have to shift gears because that's not really why we're here. We're here to hear. Well, I. This is a, a very selfishly organized talk by me because I want to know this information, and I haven't been able to find it anywhere. So when I met Sarah, I was extremely excited that someone was going to be able to come and inform me on this topic that I've um, always wanted to know about. Uh, Sarah Singa is a doctoral candidate in the, in the theology department at Georgetown, and she is, I've checked, almost done with her dissertation, so <laughs> very soon, and that's not just euphemism, it sounds like actually there's a you know, date set for defense. <laughs> uh, she's originally from Karachi, Pakistan herself, and her research is on um, comparing Christianity and Islam, and uh, her dissertation is on the Christian minority in Pakistan. Uh, her research interests also include religion and politics, theology, religious identity in South Asia. So she's going to talk to us about caste conscious among Muslims in North India and Pakistan. So please enlighten us. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, so yeah, my research is about um, Christians and Muslim minorities in Pakistan and India, um, but my real interest is on untouchable communities and so my dissertation is about Christian untouchables in Pakistan and today's talk we'll be talking about Muslim untouchables in both India um, and in Pakistan and how those communities sort of overlap. So um, a few complicated things to talk about today, the caste system, how does the caste system work, um, is it just a Hindu thing, how does it seep out of Hinduism into other religions, so because of that, we're just gonna have to spend about five or six minutes talking about the caste system, just a general overview, um, and I'll highlight a couple things that are important, and then we'll sort of see how the caste system moves its way into, or rather out of Hinduism to other religions, and then how it functions in Islam, and um, also how it functions in Christianity a little bit. I'm gonna touch on that a little bit as a, as a point of comparison. Um, so if there's a, a fair amount of foreign words in this, talk and things like that. If I go too fast or if you need clarification, just stop me and I'll be happy to explain. So the Hindu caste system, um, what we have here is basically very much arranged like a pyramid. At the very top of this pyramid you have the Brahmin caste category. The Brahmin caste category are basically the priests. Um, they're the learned scholars in the culture, in the, in the caste system. Below them are the Kshatriyas. The Kshatriyas are the warriors, the political leaders. Below them are the Vaishas. The Vaishas are largely the mercantile class in society. And below them then are the Shudras. The Shudras are the people who are essentially peasants. Um, they do uh, labor, bonded labor, that kind of thing. Um, and that pyramid, those four categories are known as collectively as the caste system, sometimes referred to as the Varna system, V-A-R-N-A. -A. The Varna system is a category of um, uh, arrangement, uh, Indian social hierarchical arrangement. Varna is something that you are born into. You do not convert into a Brahmin caste category or a Kshatriya category. You are born into it. That is your Varna. Um, the other part of caste is called Jati. It is J-A-T-I and this word means occupation. Part of, of your caste system is the combination of your Varna and your Jati. So it's what you're born into and then it's also your job which is related to your caste group. So for example, you are born into the Kshatriya group and then your job is related to that field. So being a political leader or um, being a warrior or you know that sort of thing. Um, the people who are not included in this caste system are at the bottom here in this blue box and they're known as the untouchables. We'll talk a little bit about who they are, where they came from, why they're not part of the Varna system. Um, but because the top four in this pyramid are known as the they are part of the Varna system. The untouchables are known as the Avarnas. They are the people who are not part of the Varna system. So we'll talk a little bit about where the Avarnas come from. Who are the untouchables? Where did they emerge? Um, how did they emerge? But first, we're just going to discuss the caste system a little bit. So where does the caste system come from? There are many explanations for the caste system. I'm not going to rehearse all of them. But just to give you some of the most important ones, the theological explanation of caste in Indian society generally can be related to the text, The Laws of Manu. The Laws of Manu is a famous law book. It is a Brahmanical text. It was written by a Brahmin. Um, and in this particular book, there is a very famous story which is known as the Purusha Shukta story. 
This story is actually a paraphrase from a much older text, which is known as the Rig Veda, the ancient Vedic text. The Purusha Shukta tells the story. It's paraphrased in Manu by the Brahmin Manu, and it is a story that talks about the creation of um, humanity and about the divine ordering of society. And in the Purusha Shukta, Purusha is the primordial man who gives birth to the world, who gives birth to society. And he says, from his mouth he created the priest, which is the Brahmin. From his arms he created the Kshatriya. From his thighs he created the commoner, the Vaisha. And from his feet, the servant. What you notice about this story is that the Varna is emanating out of Purusha's body. It's a divine emanation, which means that all of these Varnas, these castes, are part of the primordial man. You can also see from the story that Varnas are based on hierarchy. We have the Brahmins coming out from the head. We have the Kshatriyas coming out from the chest, the commoners coming out from the thighs, and from the feet, the servants. What you might notice about the story is that it doesn't mention the untouchables at all. They're not coming out of Purusha Shukta. They're not part of the story. We still don't really know where they've come from, but we'll talk about that. So the Varna system is based on hierarchy. One of the things that the laws of Manu does is it explains this hierarchy, and it really puts it in conversation with the concept of purity and pollution. Purity and pollution is an integral part of the Hindu caste system, of the Varna system. And as we'll see, purity and pollution is an integral part of caste in Islam, caste in Christianity. It is something that has been carried over from the Hindu caste system into other religions, and it manifests not in identical ways, but in similar ways. So purity and pollution. Manu has detailed laws in this text that deal with purity and pollution. There are things that are regarded impure. Some of these, some of these things have to do with substances. So for example, Nails are impure. Blood is impure. Um, touching somebody who has come into contact with a defiling um, substance or a defiling object is impure. Um, if you come into contact with a defiling object, you're impure. But if I come into contact with you after you've touched it, I'm also impure. Purity, has a, purity it, it does not have a sense of contagion, but impurity does. So impurity is contagious. Um, if you are involved in something impure, that impurity extends not just to you, but also to your caste group, and by extension to your village. Um, so these purity and impurity is largely related to your occupation, or it can be related to your occupation. In Manu, there are rules about how there are certain types of purity or certain types of impurity that can be ritually absolved. So let's say that you come into contact with a defiling object. Well, that's fine. You can go through ritual evolution, and then you're OK. You're no longer impure. But in Manu, there are groups of people that are always impure. They cannot ever get rid of that impurity. Impurity is part of their nature. And these people are the untouchables. In Manu, we see them referred to as a group known as the Chandala. So the Chandala, um, according to Manu, is a very dangerous thing in the Varna system because they are the result of what Manu calls caste mixing. Caste mixing is a very dangerous thing in the Hindu Varna system because as we've seen, everything is hierarchically arranged. And because it's hierarchically arranged and, uh, and specialized by occupation, mixing those castes is very dangerous because it pollutes the system. So they have to be, these castes have to be kept separate. And the way that they ensure that, or the way that it's socially um, ensured, is through the practice of endogamy. So you marry within your Varna group, by and large. Um, so according to Manu, the Chandala is um, the result of caste mixing. A Brahmin who perhaps had sexual relations with a Shudra woman or sexual relations with somebody outside the caste system, like an untouchable. And the result of that caste mixing was the creation of the Chandala group. The Chandala group then becomes impure. They are impure. They are polluted. and um, this is something that the Chandla can never do. There is nothing the Chandla can go through, no ritual ablution to get rid of this pollution. Okay. Um, so the other theories of caste, I'll just mention one or two of them that are important. Um, one of the older theories of caste emerges from a scholar named J.H. Hutton, who basically argues that caste and the concept of untouchability relates to a concept of racial purity. And this is an older theory that basically says, look, when the Aryans migrated into the Indian subcontinent, they considered themselves racially superior to the Dravidians who were living in the area. 
the indigenous peoples, and so in an effort to separate themselves and their culture from the Dravidians, they instituted this policy of racial purity, and they started practicing untouchability. Um, another theory that's very important is by Lou, uh, Louis Dumont, and he basically says that there is a, he does believe that it's based on purity and pollution, and for him, it's the entire Indian caste system is extremely, um, it's, it's very difficult for Western people to understand because we don't believe in interdependence because we value individualism so much. And for Dumont, this is a system that is entirely interdependent. The castes are socially and hierarchically arranged. They are graded. They are endogamous units. They are specialized by occupation. And they, in a sense, depend on each other. So the Brahmins have certain jobs. And they can fulfill those jobs because the Kshatriyas perform other functions. The Kshatriyas can fulfill their functions because the Shudras, the servants, do their function. So Dumont took a very kind of, um, I think, interesting view on this that he, he, he only saw the kind of beauty of the caste system, how it functions, so it's, you know, it, it, it's arranged so perfectly and, and it's like an entire body that's, um, it's, it's based on the opposites of purity and pollution. And for Dumont, it's really important that the system appears absolutely consistent and rational to the people who are involved in it. So for the people outside, we see it as irrational. We see it as inconsistent. Why are some people being treated one way and other people being treated another way? But if you're in the Varnas system, according to Dumont, it seems perfectly rational to you. Um, one of the things that he completely ignores in this, which becomes very important, especially for the emergence of untouchables as a category later on in Indian society, is he completely ignores the power dynamics involved in these relations. There are power, power dynamics involved, as has been pointed out by several scholars who have critiqued Dumont, including um, Nicholas Dirks and Patrick Oliville, who have said, first of all, he bases his entire theory by looking at Manu, which is a Brahmanical text. It was written by a particular group of people who had an agenda, and part of their agenda was to promote the caste system. And Dumont takes the story, he reads it as theological, he reads it as normative, he says, okay, this is how we have to explain the whole thing. It's about purity and pollution, it's interdependent. But he doesn't take into account the fact that the people at the very top have more power than the people at the bottom. And that the untouchables are the untouchables, yes, because of purity and pollution, but also because they're socially discriminated, they're marginalized, and they're oppressed. And that's the reason why, even though this is a theological explanation in Manu, why are the Dalits still treated the way that they're treated today? And he ignores that aspect of it. Um, the other thing that he ignores is that there is a sense in which the function of the untouchables, as anthropologist Robert Deliage says, is if we look at the entire um, Indian society as a body, the function then of the untouchables is to remove everything that's polluted from that body. Remove the waste substances, remove all of the things that carry any type of pollution, so that other people can remain pure. Um, and so this is the way that the system works. The Brahmins remain pure because the untouchables remove the impurity from society. Um, and that's one of the reasons why pol pollution is continually associated with the untouchable peoples. OK, so who are the Dalits? Why are they called Dalits? Where did they come from? We know who the untouchables are. These are people who are not part of the Varna system. They are the Avarnas. Um, but how do they come to? How do they get this title of um, Dalits? The word Dalit was first used by the Marathi reformer, Jayotiba Pule. Um, he had a very sort of complex theory about how the caste system worked. And he argued that the Avarna category developed in Indian society essentially because of power dynamics and because the um, Brahmins wanted to subjugate the indigenous people that they came across when they migrated into the Indian subcontinent and they wanted to enslave them. And so they created a fourth um, section of the caste system known as the Shudras. These people they used as peasants, as servants, to help them to do farm work, agriculture, things like that. And then they created another category called the Avarnas, the untouchables. And for these people, they just wanted to enslave them, to make them do all of the things in society that uh, nobody wanted to do. Um, these types of distinctions show up in very pronounced ways in Indian society. I already mentioned endogamy a little bit. Generally, caste groups marry within caste groups. It's quite rare to find, say, for example, a Kshatriya marrying an untouchable or a Brahmin marrying an untouchable. Um, occupational hierarchy kind of remains somewhat stagnant, although it's changing now quite a bit. But 
there is still a sense of your, especially among untouchables, there are certain jobs that are related to untouchables. And it is by and large, you can sometimes figure out people's occupation by also um, their name. So for example, an untouchable caste group, which is a huge caste group in Punjab known as the Chamars. Chamar means skin. So these are people who are leather workers. They have always worked in leather. Why are they polluted? Because the cow is very sacred in Hinduism. Anyone who touches something dead, first of all, is polluted. Anyone who touches a dead cow is doubly polluted. Anyone who actually takes cow skin and makes shoes out of it and then wears them, that's you can never recover from that. <laughs> so this is the Chamars are an example of this. Um, the third thing is commensal segregation. Purity and pollution and how it manifests in social interactions with people. Even today in India, according to a recent survey that was done about a year ago, um, it is very, very rare to find higher caste people, particularly Brahmins, interdining with untouchables. It is something that just doesn't happen. It's not about well, it doesn't happen in rural areas. I would have to say that even in emancipated communities, even in urban centers, it is highly unlikely that it's going to happen. Commensal segregation shows up in multiple ways. These are forms of discrimination that are um, prevalent against Dalits. Uh, they manifest in particular ways. For example, there's spatial segregation. Even if you are uh, sitting at, the, in, at, at an event, in the, at a festival, you're sitting together, Dalits and Brahmins will not eat together. They will be spatially segregated. Dalits will sit in one place. Brahmins will sit in another. Um, often Dalits are served food in discriminatory, in discriminatory ways. They might be served food in broken dishes. They might have to bring their own utensils. A lot of times they're refused service at restaurants and places like that because the notion is if I'm a Dalit and I come to your establishment and you give me food, if you touch my plate that I've eaten from or drank from, you then also become polluted. My pollute, pollution is contagious. You also become infected by it. So it's easier that way for people to just practice commensal segregation to not have any type of social interaction, particularly when it comes to food and drink. Um, we will talk about how this manifests in a very particular way in Pakistan, even though there's technically no caste in Islam, no caste in Pakistan, especially no caste in Pakistan, but this particular idea of commensal segregation is very prevalent, especially in urban slums. But we'll get to that in a minute. So um, the second person to use the word Dalit then and really popularize it was a Dalit reformer whose name was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar is going to become very important in our discussion a few minutes from now about Muslim Dalits. Um, <coughs> Dr. Ambedkar <coughs> first used the word Dalit. He himself was a Dalit. He was from um, the city of the state of Maharashtra. He was a Marathi, a Mahar, um, from the Mahar caste. And um, he became a Dalit reformer. So and what he, is Mahar caste? Mahar caste is a, um, the largest caste in Maharashtra. They're mostly agriculturalists. And so they're, they're Dalits. So they're, well, they're Dalits. Yeah, yeah they're, they're Dalits. Um, and he basically uh, first popularized the usage of the word Dalit in the Indian context. The word Dalit has 16 meanings associated with it. Most commonly, the word Dalit means to crack, to split, be broken, torn asunder, downtrodden, scattered, crushed, and destroyed. Um, in general, when people use the word Dalit, they are really talking about it as downtrodden and crushed. Although in Dalit theology and things, you'll see theologians playing with sort of all of the meanings associated with the term. Um, <clears throat> this definition of the untouchables emerges because this group has had the experiences, as I've said, of occupational hierarchy, of commensal segregation in society, of the practice of endogamy, all of the caste persecution and discrimination that accompanies their Avarna status. And this is why the term Dalit is a self-conscious title um, that is being used by the community. It's an empowering term for the community. They reject the word untouchable. They reject the word avarna because to, to um, accept the word avarna is to accept the varna system. So they have instead said, we want to be called Dalits. This is our word of empowerment to say that, yes, we are crushed and yes, we are downtrodden. But if we take the word avarna, it means that we somehow um, uh, believe in the Brahmanical varna system, which we reject, which we don't. Okay, so what we can see is that the Dalits um, in Indian society have at different times been very discriminated against and persecuted. And at some points in Indian history, this has led to what is known as the mass movements. 
The mass movements were localized mass conversion movements, which were initiated by low caste and Dalit people. So Dalits essentially took the initiative to convert. Um, so I want to give you some examples here of this. The Chura caste in the Punjab. Chura caste in the Punjab was one of the largest caste groups um, in Punjab region in United India. In, uh, during the colonial period, near the end of the colonial period, census data reveals that there were close to, in Punjab, over three million Churas living in Punjab. They were considered one of the most despised castes in um, Indian history, um, <coughs> which was related to their jobs. Churas essentially worked in the sanitation industry. Sanitation industry, if for people living in America, sounds like that's not so bad. Um, very bad <laughs> back in the day. It basically means that you were a remover of night soil. So you remove human excrement, you clean public latrines, you do this with your hands, there's no fancy equipment, there's nothing like that, there's no, um, you know, there's no gloves or anything. You um, are either a domestic sweeper where you street the cl uh, uh, clean the streets or you are a private sweeper where you clean people's houses. Again, cleaning people's bathrooms, um, cleaning people's toilets. Sometimes if you're a munici municipal sweeper, you also have the jobs of cleaning sewage pipes for the streets and things like that. Um, the Churas were some of the most despised people because of their occupation. They were considered highly polluting. Um, many things that Churas had to do, they lived segregated in their own villages, but if they ever came into contact with higher caste people, very common practices um, surrounded the Churas. For example, Churas were not allowed to walk through a high caste village without removing their shoes. Um, Churas could not walk through or, or next to a high caste person without first informing them that they were there by playing a drum. The reason for this was that there was a belief that if the shadow of a chura um, fell on, the sha on, the per on a high caste person, the high caste person would become polluted and they would have to engage in ritual um, uh, ablution. So Dalits started wearing drums around their necks, drums which were also, by the way, made of leather. It's become a very symbolic form of protest for Dalits in modern India to use the drum as a type of uh, a symbol of, of assertion because drums were the drums that um, Dalits used were always made out of leather as they were considered polluting. So Dalits had to beat drums, Churas had to beat drums to announce that they were coming so that high caste people could move out of the way. Um, high caste people would generally hire Churas to come and perform funeral rites in their villages and things because touching dead um, is, uh, is, is polluting. So churas would always be somehow associated with death, pollution, cremation, sanitation, things like that. Um, in the 18, late 1800s, uh, <coughs> Protestant missionaries started working in the Punjab region. Initially, they were under the mistaken um, sort of idea that, well, if we work on the high caste Hindus and we convert them, they'll take the Christian message and they'll spread it around low caste people. Okay, well, we've just kind of talked about how that's not likely to happen. So that's initially what the Protestant missionaries did first. They focused on the high caste people. They didn't have a lot of success. And then finally, they, um, there was a man uh, in Punjab. He was a Chura. His name was Dit. He um, was converted. He was one of the first people converted in the Chura caste. And he became a Chura evangelist. And basically, by 1930, 92% of the Chura caste in Punjab converted to Christianity, okay? Protestant Christianity is considered one of the largest mass movements to Christianity during this time period. Um, now, that's what happened to um, the Churas. There were other caste groups also living in Punjab and in North India at the time. I'm just focusing on the largest groups. There's hundreds and hundreds of, of castes and subcastes. Uh, the Chamars in Punjab. We already talked about the Chamars a little earlier. They're leather workers. Their work is polluting because they work with leather. Chamars were also very attracted to conversion. They looked at Christianity. Some of them were interested in it. By and large, the Chamars converted to Islam during this period. Um, a third caste group, yes? So there was a very large number converted to Christianity, but then they also converted to Islam? The rest, yeah. Oh, the rest. Mm -hmm. Third caste group in North India, Megs, sometimes it's spelled Megwar, and the Ansars. Both of these caste groups are weavers. If the word uh, sari, which I'm sure everybody knows, comes from the word ansar, the ansars are the weavers of saris. They make, the ansaris make saris. So they're the weavers. The megs are also weavers. They weave linen cloth. Why are the megs and the ansaris considered polluting? 
Weavers, at least back in traditional society, used to use the lower half of their body to weave. Okay, so if you have seen the images of Gandhi sitting on the floor with the, using his foot to weave, because they used the lower half of their body in their occupation, they were considered polluting. Um, Megs, Ansars, Chamars, Churas, because of their poverty, they also had a number of other practices that made them polluted. For example, because they didn't really have access to protein and things like that, they started the practice of eating carrion. This was a polluting exercise. Um, if there was ever dead cattle on any farm, because the Dalits were so poor, they would remove that dead cattle and a lot of times they would eat it. This was also polluting. So not just beef eating, but also uh, carrion and eating leftovers and things. So the Megs and the Ansars uh, converted to Islam. What's interesting about the Megs is why did they convert to Islam? It's a very funny story. They were actually approached by the Protestant missionaries in Punjab, and they were very attracted to um, Christianity. The Megs, by and large, in Punjab worked for Muslim landowners. They were agri worked in agriculture. Now, the Muslim landowners, apparently, from what, from what scholars say, were kind of hesitant about Megs converting to Christianity because they said, well, we're going to lose some labor if they become Christians. They don't want to work on Sundays. And also, you know, what if they start eating and drinking things that are not allowed in Islam? And what are we going to do about that? So they kind of discouraged the Megs to convert to Christianity. But because of this concept of caste and how deeply it runs in society and the notion of occupational hierarchy and how everything's graded, um, the Megs actually found out that the Churas in the Punjab were very interested in Christianity. The Megs are weavers, and remember the Churas, they engage in sanitation. They're the most despised caste of all at that time. The Megs were so put off by the fact that the Churas were becoming Christian, they said, oh, no, no, we're not going to become Christian because the Christians, Christianity is a Chura religion. <laughs> and our caste is higher. So they completely dropped their support of the Protestant missionaries, and they converted to Islam. Um, now, what happened to these people? Were they accepted? Also, some, some of these caste groups that I've mentioned, uh, Bhangis, that was another caste group. They were scavengers, by and large. Bhangis also converted to Christianity, Islam, and Sikhism. Some Chamars and Churas also became Sikh. Um, so what happened to these <laughs> caste groups when they became Christian, Sikh, Muslim, um, Muslims. So by and large, the um, members of these Dalit groups that became Sikh were known as Mazabi Sikhs. Mazabi means Sikh by practice. So it's an immediate identifier that they are not fully Sikh, they're not fully part of the Sikh tradition, but they are only Sikh by practice. So they converted into it, and it's, an, it's um, a reminder for them and for everybody else that they emerged out of the untouchable group. And what happened to some of the Muslims who converted, some, I'm sorry, some of the um, Dalits who converted to Islam is they were given the title Musali. Musali means little Muslim. So even today in Pakistan, you will refer, it's, um, it's kind of a sort of derogatory term to call somebody a Musali, but it's a very, very much part of colloquial language. You might say, oh, so and so is a Musali, you know, it's a, a fake Muslim, a not real Muslim, a Dalit Muslim is what it really means. Um, but the fact is that whether it's, you know, derogatory pejorative term in the colloquial language, we do have millions and millions of Musalis in India and in Pakistan who are not fully accepted into the Islamic tradition. Same with the Mazabis. So who are the Muslim Dalits then in North India? Um, and I'm going to talk about North India first and then go across the border to Pakistan where things are a little bit different. Um, the word Muslim Dalit, that, that, that uh, the phrase was coined by Dr. Ijaz Ali. He is a Dalit, he is a Muslim, he comes from the Chamar group. Um, and he coined this phrase um, when he founded an organization in India called the All India Backward Muslim Morcha. In India, when people use the word backward or backward caste, they are talking about disadvantaged caste or Dalits, untouchables, things like that. Um, he claims that almost all the Muslims in India are descendants of local converts. They are not the people who came from Arabia. They are locals who converted to Islam. And they're not just locals who converted to Islam, but according to Ajaz Ali, who is the de facto leader of the Muslim Dalit um, organization community in North India, particularly in Bihar and uh, UP, he says that there are one, over 100 million Muslim Dalits in India. 32% of Punjab is Dalit, 20% of Uttar Pradesh, 20% of Bihar, 20% of the state of Maharashtra. Remember, Maharashtra is where the Dalit reformer 
um, BR and Bedkar comes from, and of course Punjab is where we've talked about all of these conversions, mass movements occurring. So 75% of the Indian Muslim population is from a Dalit background. That means they are either, they used to be Chamars or Churas, Bhangis, Megs, Ansaris, fill in the blank, there's lots. Um, how do the Muslim Dalits explain um, caste in their community in India? Well, now some of them use very strong language about caste. They claim that it is an infection. It is a disease that has seeped into Islam from Hinduism. It is not something that is um, part of the Islamic tradition. It has destroyed the Ummah. Um, it is not something that should be part of the Islamic tradition. Um, however, uh, and we'll see in a minute, there are other people who argue that actually caste is very much part of Islam and it's part of the Islamic tradition and they have their own method of uh, describing what that is and we'll get there in a second. Now, according to Muslim Dalits who um, do a number of things in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and um, in uh, 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 Maharashtra, um, there's a newspaper called Dalit Voice. There's a newspaper called Dalit Muslim Voice. There are several Muslim Dalit organizations. Um, and these writers and social activists argue that endogamy is very, very uh, pronounced between Muslim Dalits and people in uh, Muslims in North India who are not from a Dalit background. They will not intermarry with people who are outside their caste group. And commensal segregation is also extremely pronounced. They will not eat and drink together, even at festivals, even on Eid. The um, Dalit Muslims have a separate eating place. The other Muslims have a separate eating place. The only way that this differs kind of from the purity and pollution associated with the Varna system that we discuss is that even among Muslim Dalits, there is no restriction on entrance to mosques. So it is not really a common practice in Muslim communities in India or in Pakistan to restrict a Muslim Dalit from entering a mosque. This happens in Hinduism, though. For years and years and years, Dalits were restricted entrance to Hindu temples. And one of the ways in which Dalits have protested against this, in many ways led by Dr. Ambedkar um, during the Dalit protest movements, was to demand entrance into Hindu temples and things like that. So that's the one um, piece of contrast in this, but otherwise we have very similar practices. Um, segregation pertains to Pakistan as well? The, there's no segregation in mosques. Okay. Yeah. No, not mosques, yeah. but Commensal yeah. segregation, yeah, yeah, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that next. Um, first North India and then I'll go over there. So um, there are some Muslim Dalits then who claim that caste is actually a part of the Islamic tradition in North India um, and that, it, it, yes, in some way it mimics the um, Hindu uh, caste system. And so this is why we had some background on the Hindu caste system, these theories of where the Hindu caste system comes from, whether it's racial purity or um, purity and pollution. As we'll see when we think, talk about the Muslim caste system, how much of it is mimicking the Hindu caste system. Now, according to Dalits, um, the Muslim caste system is based on a theory by a 14th century uh, Turkish scholar whose name is Ziauddin Barani. Ziauddin Barani was in the court of Muhammad bin Tuklaq. He was a writer, he was a philosopher, he was a thinker. And one of the things that he wrote that got a lot of attention was something that's known as the Fatwa Jahandari. In this Fatwa Jahandari, he identifies that there are three distinct castes in Islam. Uh, he does not use the word Varna for them, but he does say there are three distinct groups in Islam. At the very top of this pyramid are the Ashraf. The Ashraf are the people who are noble. According to Ziauddin Barani, the Ashraf are people who claim a foreign ancestry. So they are the people who come from a Persian background, from an Arab background, um, from a um, Afghani background, but they are not people who are indigenous Indians, Dravidians, who are basically Dalits, right? He's trying to draw a distinction between the Ashraf and the rest. Um, the Ajlaf are people who you might consider higher caste Hindus who converted to Islam. So maybe you were a Shatriya and you converted to Islam, or you were a Vaisha and you converted to Islam, and then you would be an Ajlaf. You wouldn't be Ashraf because you weren't foreign, you were local, but you weren't Dalit. And then the third category is the Arzils. The Arzils are the Dalit Muslims, all the people that we've just finished discussing, the Chamars, the Churas, the Bhangis, the Megs, the Ansars, just to name a few, the Madigas. Um, so in this, um, and they're, they're the people that we've talked about as being the Musalis. <coughs> 
Um, in this fatwa, Ziauddin Barani describes the qualities that are assigned to um, the Ashraf and the Ajlaf and the Arzil. And you should see echoes of Manu in here in the way that he has described the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas and what their occupations are and what their jobs are. Um, the qualities of the highborn um, are the Ashraf. They are, they are born virtuous. They're ennobled at birth. It is in them innately. Uh, very similar to what Manu says about the Brahmins. Um, and as far as the lowborn, who are the Ajlaf, they are the custodian of all vices. Anything that is bad in society or whatever, morality, can be traced to the Ajlaf. But that's not as bad as the Arzil, because who are the Arzil? They are contaminated with meanness and based on, um, I'm sorry, they are the most degraded and exist only for servitude. Again echoes a lot of what Manu said about the Chandala. Who, is, who are the Chandala there? The Chandala are the polluted, who have no considerations in Dharma. They should be excluded from the Varna system because of their pollution. Um, now, according to Muslim Dalits, endogamy and commensal segregation is a common practice in Islam in North India based on this caste system as well. So there is a belief in uh, North Indian Islam that there are people who are Ashraf, there are people who are Arzil, and they should not eat together, they should not intermarry, they should be kept entirely separate. Um, now, some, some scholars have said, well, you know, this isn't really a caste system, it's just kind of Islam adapting to um, Hindu practices, and they're just kind of incorporating or accommodating their traditions for um, the Hindu caste system. And I think Muslim Dalits would say, well, uh, it doesn't really matter if they're doing that or not, because 100 million of us are extremely discriminated against and persecuted against in the society not just by the Hindus, but by Muslims in our own, in our own community. Um, so what are the political issues facing Muslim Dalits in India? There are several. Um, that a lot of it has to do with their Dalit status. And this is particularly interesting why Ijaz Ali in the late 19, I'm sorry, early 1990s decided to organize his community under this title of Muslim Dalit. The word Dalit is a very politically charged term in India, um, partially because in 1935 there was a list or a schedule that was drawn up of the castes who were considered the most marginalized in society or the most backward. And this list of castes was known as the scheduled castes. Scheduled castes um, are assigned now in um, modern India what's known as scheduled caste benefits. It's a type of affirmative action which is put towards the scheduled caste, so the Chamars, Churas, the Ansars, the Bhangis, as a way of bringing them political and social empowerment. This system was actually introduced by Dr. B.R. Ambedkar because Dr. Ambedkar, in addition to being a Dalit reformer, was also the drafter of the Indian constitution. So yes, he was Dalit, and yes, he dealt with a lot of discrimination. He was a jurist, and he was also a, um, a very well-respected person. And after many fights with Gandhi over the caste issue and after being Gandhi's harshest critic, um, right after um, the partition of India, B.R. Ambedkar was appointed to draft the constitution and he included something in the constitution called scheduled caste benefits. The problem with scheduled caste benefits is that the Indian government does not recognize caste discrimination as an issue unless you are Hindu. According to the Indian government, if you convert out of Hinduism, caste is no longer a problem. You shouldn't be applying for caste benefits because caste is no longer your, your, your concern. In 1956, Article um, 341 was amended to extend scheduled caste benefits to hin from Hindu Dalits to also include Sikh Dalits. So these Mazabi Sikhs yeah, that we talked about earlier, now in 1956, they could also have um, uh, they could also claim affirmative action benefits by going to the government and saying, well, we are Sikhs, we are Mazabi, but we still feel the same discrimination that we did as Dalits, and we should have scheduled caste benefits. In 1990, this was extended to Neo-Buddhists. The reason this was extended to Neo-Buddhists is entirely related to Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar in 1956, as a Dalit leader and as a person who firmly believed that there was absolutely no um, no justice for his society, for the, for the Mahar Dalits in India without religious conversion. In 1956, Dr. Ambedkar, in a public ceremony in the city of Nagpur, converted to Buddhism with 400,000 people. Almost the entire Mahar caste living in the area converted to Buddhism with Dr. Ambedkar. 
um, on the 50 year anniversary of Dr. Ambedkar's death, an additional, I think it was 400,000 or an additional 500,000 Mahars, Dalits, converted to Buddhism again. Um, they can keep converting to Buddhism, and there are some other reasons for that, but it's essentially because of Dr. Ambedkar. Because of this huge movement to Buddhism out of the Mahar caste, and because of its, con its relationship with Dr. Ambedkar, in 1990, the scheduled caste benefits were extended to Buddhists. Now, according to the Indian constitution, the definition of a Hindu is someone who is not, it's a negative definition, someone who is not a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. Everyone else, you're good. So that means in India, if you're Buddhist, if you're Sikh, if you're Jain, if you're obviously Hindu, if you're Baha'i, if you're anything, you are considered Hindu according to the Indian constitution. It's essentially any religion in India, in the Indian subcontinent that has some relationship to Hinduism, you're protected. But if you're, a Hin if you're a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew, you're not considered Hindu. So scheduled caste benefits are not given to Muslim Dalits or Christian Dalits in India, but they are given to everybody else. Why would the Muslim Dalits then choose this category? Because the minute they identify themselves as Muslim Dalits, they cut themselves off from scheduled caste benefits. Um, well, this becomes a very politically charged issue for Hindu nationalist groups in India. This becomes one of the reasons and their points of um, forcing Dalits, of, uh, particularly Muslims and Christians, to convert back to Hinduism. Because what they argue is, look, we have this thing called a Shuddhi ceremony, it's a purification ceremony. You come to us, we go, we put you through Shuddhi, you are now cleansed, and you are back into the Hindu fold. Are you still Dalit? Yes, but now you can get scheduled caste benefits, affirmative action. You can get a job, you can get access to education, you can get all of these things. This is a way for them to increase numbers and get um, Muslims and Christians back into the Dalit uh, fold. It's been Hindu fold, it's been happening for a long time. It's one of the things that Muslim Dalits in their writing repeatedly complain about, the pressure of religious conversion from Hindu nationalist groups. Um, is it happening? Is it happening? Oh yes, very much. Um, but it's partially because of this issue of scheduled caste benefits. Now, I'm not saying Muslims cannot get any, um, any governmental benefits. They can because they're minorities, so they can, get a they can get government benefits in India by being minorities but they cannot access scheduled caste benefits because they're Muslim Dalits. Um, so this, this is a, a big point of contention with Hindu nationalist groups. Um, the Muslim Dalits also have a very interesting narrative about their origins and their stories. This is something that in Dalit communities is a common practice, and it's a way of reimagining their um, origins to try to describe where they came from and why they're assigned a polluted status in society. And it's a way of rejecting the Varna system. It's a way of rejecting the story that Manu tells of the Purusha Shukta. Um, and for the Muslim Dalits, their story is that they are the broken men and they are broken because um, Pakistan, specifically Pakistan is something that comes up a lot in their writing, was an Ashraf enterprise. It was made for the Ashraf, it was made by the Ashraf. So it was all of the people who focused on the creation of Pakistan claimed a foreign ancestry. They say this about all the leaders in the Pakistan movement, Muhammad Iqbal, um, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the entire members of the Muslim League. If you look back at them, they were all Sayyids, they were sheikhs, they had Arab ancestry, they had Persian ancestry. So basically, Pakistan was made for the Ashraf, and it was made by the Ashraf. And the Muslim Dalits, the Arzils, they were not invited to come. And so they say that they are in North India now, suffering all of these things because Pakistan rejected them. They were left behind as the Ashraf moved into Pakistan for a much better life. That may or may not be true. I don't really know that there's a way to verify it, but this is something that comes up. And this is also interesting because one of the things that Muslim Dalits are accused of is being sympathetic to Pakistan. Right? So you're sympathetic to Pakistan as, Indi as Indian Muslims. There's always this distrust that you're always going to side with Pakistan if something happens. The Muslim Dalits say, you know what? Pakistan doesn't want us. They've never wanted us. If I could just say that, yeah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah yeah. had the Gujarati Puja ancestry, which is indigenous in the Iqbal, yeah. was also descended from Pakistan. Yes, but this and is like their story. Them. So they didn't, nobody claimed that they came from outside. Yes, but this is what the Muslim Dalits are saying. I'm not saying it's historically okay. verifiable. Right, but that's true fact. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, but <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is their narrative of, you know, how it, um, Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Um, 
but this writing is happening now. So it's happening like in the past five years. Um, and it's just a particular thing that comes up where they say that what they're really doing is they're using the story of the broken men, which was a story that B.R. Ambedkar popularized for the Mahar community. Um, and they're trying to make a parallel structure for that story by basically saying we are also broken because we were broken from the Ashraf when the Ashraf went to Pakistan and left us behind. So I think with these stories, a lot of the historicity is not really important. It's about how the narrative functions for their community. Um, so caste consciousness in Pakistan, how does it manifest? Generally, caste is actively, socially, and politically denied in Pakistan. Nobody wants to talk about caste. Um, are there Dalits in Pakistan? Yes, there are huge populations of uh, Hindu Dalits in Pakistan, particularly in Sindh province. Um, in Punjab, of course, there are still Churas. Um, as I mentioned, almost 90% of the Chura caste in Punjab did convert to Protestant Christianity. Now some of those Churas um, also live in Sindh, Balochistan, KPK, Khaibak Pakhtunkhwa province. Um, there are 40 scheduled caste tribes listed officially on, uh, in Pakistani law. They are the Bheels, the Bhagris, the Balmikis, the Bhangis, the Megs, the Kolkis, and the Od. Most of these in Pakistan are Hindu. However, Balmikis, Bhangis, Megwars, Colts, and Odes are also Musali Muslim, and some of them are also Christian. Um, almost 90% of the Protestant church in Pakistan does come from a Chura background. We also have, of course, a very diverse Christian population in Pakistan, so huge Catholic population, which are, uh, the Catholic population generally is um, from Goa. Um, and then we also have Seventh-day Adventists, Brethren, Charismatics, Evangelicals, the whole thing. But the two largest groups, Catholics and Protestants. 90% of the Protestant church, Punjabi, and that Punjabi church is the descendant of the Chura conversions, mass movements um, in Punjab. Um, caste discrimination is rampant against Hindu Dalits and Chura Christians. From my own work in urban slums, where I focus entirely on Chura Christians living in Karachi, um, commensal segregation between Muslims and Chura Christians and Hindu Dalits is extremely pronounced. Uh, for example, people that I have talked to and interviewed will say they're routinely refused service at restaurants. There's a particular section in um, urban slums where they sell vegetables and fruit which are <coughs> reserved for Dalits. This fruit is usually, the food is usually spoiled or it's rotting or it's bruised or it's whatever. Um, many Chura Christians have reported that if they go into restaurants, Muslims will refuse to serve them or they'll charge them, let's say, 15 rupees, which for a person who lives in a slum is a lot of money, uh, for a glass of water because they'll have to replace the cup when, <coughs> after they've drunk out of it because the Muslims will not touch these things after um, these, these Dalits have uh, touched them. In terms of language, the word Chura, Chamar, Bhangi is very commonly used in Pakistan. They're pejorative terms, but they are also caste names, and we can't ignore that dimension of it. So you might be, you know, uh, trying to accuse some, you might be just calling someone a, a bad name by saying, oh, you're a Bhangi or you're a Chamar, but it is a caste name. And for people who are from that caste group, so for example, for the Chura Christians, and for the Hindus, who many of them are Chamars uh, and Balmikis and Pangis, it's very offensive to hear those words because they're aware of the fact that this is their caste group. Um, there is rampant discrimination against Musalis in Pakistan. For example, in Karachi, uh, we have a very large leather market, and that leather market is almost entirely still dominated by the Chamar caste group. Now, leather doesn't carry the same you know, issues with it in Pakistan that it does in Hinduism, of course. It's not considered polluting. But the Chamars, when partition happened and they moved over into Pakistan, have remained in that caste occupation. So by and large, the leather workers in Karachi are from a Chamar background. And if you get to know them quite well and you spend a lot of time in their village, they will let you in on their secret and they will let you know at some point, by the way, we're Musali. So they will identify themselves that way. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Purity and pollution in Pakistan manifest through a concept known as Pak and Na Pak. The word Pak in, Pak in Urdu means clean or pure. The name Pakistan means land of pure, land of clean. Um, and the word Na Pak is the opposite. It means unclean and pure. In the colloquial language, when we use these terms in Pakistan, we just, it's a very general sort of word. Uh, that plate is now Na Pak. It's, it's dirty. Um, Something on the floor is not Bach, it's dirty, whereas something is Bach, it's clean. But in urban slums, according to the research that I have done, among Jura Christians, among Musali Muslims, 
and among Hindu Dalits, this concept becomes very pertinent because it is a form of commensal segregation that occurs um, in, in Islamic society, and it's practiced through something that we call the Biradri system. So the Biradri system is a system of brotherhood. It is based on purity of blood. It is based on blood membership. And um, in, again, in the colloquial, we use this all the time. What is your Biradri? What is your Biradri? It means what is your tribal membership? What is your uh, blood membership? So if somebody asks me, what is my Biradri? I would say Punjabi because that's my ethnic relationship. Ethnic, uh, that's how I, I ethnically identify myself. Um, however, in Pakistan, the Biradri system tends to mimic the Varna system, not in all cases, but particularly in rural areas and in urban slums, this happens a lot, where the Biradri system tends to uh, mimic the Varna system. And it is held together by a concept of Pak and not Pak. So you will hear people say things like, I'm not going to marry this person because they're not my Biradri. Why? Because they're not Pak. Um, I'm not going to eat with this person. Why? They're not in my Biradri. Why? Because they're not Pak. Um, in that sense, scholars who have analyzed the caste system as it emerges in North India have said that yes, in Pakistan it also manifests through the Biradri system, which tends to mimic the Varna system in many ways. And this concept of Pak and not Pak is not as pronounced as it is in Hinduism, not as pronounced as purity and pollution, but it does happen. Um, even in Pakistan, there is a concept that the Ashraf are the people who are the pure of blood. You will hear this repeated when people are arranging marriages and things like that. So and so is a Sayyid. My daughter, we're a Sayyid family. We have to arrange a marriage with Sayyids. Why? Because their blood is Pak. Now you can say someone Sayyid and you want to marry them because they come from a good family or because you, know, uh, you have the same background or whatever, but it's very odd to say because our blood is pure. <laughs> and so my argument is, it, it does happen, um, and especially if you spend a lot of time with Musali communities and things like that, and they tell you, they reveal to you that they are Musali, or you spend a lot of time with Christians and they tell you that they are Chura, and then they'll start talking to you about their understanding of what is Bach and what is not Bach. And it relates to purity of blood. Um, it is a concept that happens, it is a concept that comes up. The Arzul Muslims in Pakistan today, so the Musalis that we talked about, the Churas, Jamars, Bhangis, um, they are considered largely Napak. So again, there's no segregation in mosques or anything like that, but you will find if you go to restaurants, local eating places where people will say, we're not going to give that person food even though they're Muslim, they're Napak. Why are they Napak? And if you really push them, they're Musali. So there's an awareness of Dalit ancestry it still comes into the Pakistani society. Of course, officially nobody wants to talk about caste in Pakistan, and politically there's no reason to talk about caste because Pakistan has absolutely no caste benefits or anything like that, no scheduled caste benefits. There's no affirmative action, there's nothing. So it's uh, better for people in Pakistan to ignore caste entirely, but um, this is how it manifests in rural areas. And that's a wrap.